A European friend of mine and myself were arrested on Broadway in broad daylight while looking for a taxi. He had been here three days. He had not yet mastered English and I was showing him the wonders of the city of New York. He was impressed and bewildered, though he also seemed rather to wonder what purpose it served. When suddenly, down from heaven, or up through the sidewalk, two plainclothes men appeared, separated us. Scarcely a word was spoken. I watched my friend, carried by the scruff of the neck, vanish into the crowd. Not a soul seemed to notice, apparently it happened every day. I was pushed into the doorway of a drugstore and frisked, made to empty my pockets, made to roll up my sleeves and asked what I was doing around here, around here, being in the city in which I was born. I'm an old hand at this. Policemen have always loved to pick me up and sometimes to beat me up. So I said nothing during this entire operation. I was worried about my friend who might fail to understand the warmth of his reception in the land of the free. Worried about his command of English, especially when confronted by somewhat special brand used by the police. Neither of us carried knives or guns. Neither of us used dope. So much for the criminal aspect. Furthermore, my friend was a married man with two children here on a perfectly respectable visit. And he had not even come from some dirty and disreputable place like Greece, but from geometric and solvent Switzerland so much for morals. I was not exactly a bum either, so I wondered what the cop would say. He seemed extremely disappointed I carried no weapons, that my veins were not punctured, disappointed, and therefore more reluctant than ever. I conveyed to him with some force that I was not precisely helpless and that I was perfectly able and more than willing to cause him a great deal of trouble. Why exactly? had he picked us up. He was now confused, afraid, and apologetic, which caused me to despise him from the bottom of my heart. He said, how many times have I heard it that there had been a call out to pick up two guys who looked just like us? White and black, you mean? Apart from my friends, I think I can name on the fingers of one hand all the Americans I have ever met who were able to answer a direct question, a real question, but well, not exactly. Hell no, I hadn't even known that the other guy was white. He thought that he was Puerto Rican, which says something very interesting. I think about the eye of the beholder, like as it were, to like. Nevertheless, he was in a box. It was not going to be a simple matter of apologizing and letting me go. Unless he was able to find his friend and my friend, I was going to force him to arrest me and then bring charges for false arrest. So, not without difficulty, we found my friend, who had been released and was waiting in the bar around the corner from our house. He also had baffled his interlocutor. He had baffled him by turning out to be exactly what he said he was, which contains its own comment, I think, concerning the attitudes of Americans have toward each other. He had given my friend a helpful tip. If he wanted to make it in America, it would be better for him not to be seen with niggers. My friend thanked him warmly, which brought a glow. I should imagine to his simple heart how we adore simplicity and has since made something of a point of avoiding white Americans. I certainly can't blame him. For one thing, talking to Americans is usually extremely uphill work. We are afraid to reveal ourselves because we trust ourselves so little. American attitudes are appalling but so are the attitudes of most of the people of the world. What is stupefying here is the attitude is presented as the person who is expected to justify the attitude in order to reassure the person whom, alas, one has yet to meet, who is light years ahead in some dreadful private labyrinth. And in this labyrinth, the person is desperately trying not to find out what he really feels. Therefore, the truth cannot be told, even about one's attitude, we live by lies, and not only, for example, about race, whatever, by this time in this country or indeed in the world, this word may mean, but about our very natures. The lie has penetrated to our most private moments in the most secret chambers of our hearts. 
Nothing more sinister can happen in any society to any people. And when it happens, it means that that people are caught in a kind of vacuum between their present and their past, the romanticized, that is, the maligned past, and the denied and dishonored present. It is a crisis of identity, and in this in such a crisis, at such pressure, it becomes absolutely indispensable to discover or invent the two words here are synonymous. The stranger, the barbarian, who is responsible for our confusion and our pain. Once he is driven out, destroyed, then we can be at peace. Those questions will be gone. Of course, those questions will never go, but it has always seemed much easier to murder than to change. And this is really the choice with which we are confronted now. I know that these are strong words for a sunlight lit, optimistic land lulled for so long and into such a euphoria by prosperity based on the threat of war and by such magazines as Reader's Digest and stirring political slogans in Hollywood and television. Communications whose role is not to communicate, but simply to reassure. Nevertheless, I'm appalled, for example, by the limpness in which the entire nation appears to have accepted the proposition that the city of Dallas, Texas, in which handbills were being issued accusing the late President Kennedy of treason, one would need a leftist lunatic with a gun to blow off the president's head. Leftists have a hard time in the South. There cannot be very many there. I certainly have never followed around southern streets by leftist lunatics, but state troopers. Similarly, there are a great many people in Texas, or for that matter, in America, with far stronger reasons for wishing the president dead than any demented castorite who could have had. Quite apart now from what time we reveal the truth of this case to have been, it is reassuring to feel that the evil came from without, and it is no way connected with the moral climate of America. Reassuring to feel that the enemy sent the assassin from far away, and that we ourselves could never have nourished so monstrous a personality, or be in any way whatever responsible for such a cowardly and bloody act. Well, the America of my experience has worshipped and nourished violence for long, as I have been on earth. The violence has been perpetrated mainly against black men, though the strangers, and so it didn't count. But if a society permits one portion of its citizenry to be menaced or destroyed, then very soon no one in that society is safe. The forces thus released in the people can never be held in check but run their devouring course, destroying the very foundation which it was imagined they would save. But we are unbelievably ignorant concerning what goes on in our country, to say nothing of what goes on in the rest of the world, and appear to have become too timid to question what we are told. Our fear to trust one another deeply enough to be able to talk to one another has become so great that people with questions in their hearts do not speak them. Our opulence is so pervasive that people who are afraid to lose whatever they think they have persuade themselves of the truth of a lie and help disseminate it. And God help the innocent here, that man or woman who simply wants to love and be loved. Unless this would-be lover is able to replace his or her backbone with a steel rod he or she is doomed. This is no place for love. I know that I am now expected to make a bow in the direction of those millions of unremarked happy marriages all over America. But I am unable, honestly, to do so because I find nothing whatever in our moral and social climate. And I am now thinking particularly of the state of our children to bear witness to this existence. I suspect that when we refer to these happy and so marvelously invisible people, we are simply being nostalgic concerning the happy, simple, God-fearing life which we imagine ourselves once to have lived. In any case, 
Wherever love is found, it unfailingly makes itself felt in the individual, the personal authority of the individual. Judged by this standard, we are a loveless nation. The best that can be said is that some of us are struggling. And what we are struggling against is that death in the heart of which leads not only to the shedding of blood, but which reduces human beings to corpses while they live.